Hey there, I'm Vicki Howell, and welcome to episode seven of Craftish. Today's guest is Lisa Anderson Schaefer, a fine artist and the founding designer of the modern jewelry company Zelma Rose. Over her career, Lisa has paired with a ton of really cool creative companies like Mod Cloth, West Helm, and Tiny Prince, and is also the West Coast expert contributor for Martha Stewart Living. Now, that should have been enough for me to have her on my radar, and I'm starting to doubt my industry cred that it was not enough. But actually, how I found her is that she and I are both instructors for the online education company Creative Live. And thanks to the former Craft & Maker channel head, Elizabeth Madriaga, I was able to hook up with her and have just a lovely conversation. And during that, I found her to be insightful, passionate, and thoughtful and generous. And we got to spend some time just chatting about creativity, motherhood, and really just what makes art, art. So uh, without further ado, here's Lisa. Lisa Anderson Schaefer, welcome to Craftish. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Vicki. I'm so excited to be here talking with you today. I was um, I was reading that you are also a parent. And whenever I have the opportunity to, to talk to another creative working mom, I jump on, I I jump on that as an opportunity because, um, you know, there are obvious challenges. And I I love there was something that you said in an interview that you wrote, when comparing myself to boss ladies without kids, we are not even running the same race. And that, um, that definitely struck a chord with me. And and, and I wanted to, I want to hear, I want to talk a little bit more about that and just share why uh, well, one of the reasons why that resonated with me is it wasn't until um, I re- remember a few years ago, my mom said to me, I I can't understand why Rachel Ray is, has, you know, garnered the success she has. And when are you going to get that same level of success? Because you, because you're just as talented. And I kind of giggled because she's a mom. Of course, she thinks that. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but then I said, but mom, she doesn't have children. I I am just success as successful. My success is just looks differently. Like I've built the life that works for me. And I wanted to know if you felt the same way, if you're if you feel like your success is defined differently because part of that success is that you have, you know, a beautiful child. I think, wow, yeah. I, I mean, I just got chills listening to you because I, I feel so many things about this topic. <laughs> And many times I fall on both sides of the fence. So um, I'll explain that too. But I, I think it has to do with a lot of things. I think success, how we define success has to do with also the kind of parent we want to be. Mm. And for me, it's very, very hands-on. It is about very much about being there to get my daughter to the bus in the morning and being there to pick her up. At, you know, at the time that she's let out of school. And, and that's just me. I have friends who feel like their day has to look a lot different to be the type of parent that they want to be, to be the best parent that they want to be. So that's sort of the first idea that I had to have of, you know, what my life was going to be like as a business person and as a parent. And I, I feel like to try and make that decision about the kind of parent you want to be and the kind of business person you want to be before you have that baby in your arms is very hard to plan for. Oh, absolutely. In, in fact, I, I think impossible. Yeah, it, it's it's very hard because you just don't know. I I didn't know until, you know, the, and it happened very quickly for me. The second the doctor put my daughter in my arms, I, I just kind of knew that I wanted to be there like all the time. Right. <laughs> And that was surprising to me. That wasn't something that my husband and I had even really talked about along this, you know, chaotic journey that I had had with my profession kind of leading up to when my daughter was born. But so that that's kind of one piece of it. And then the other piece is exactly, you know, defining what success looks like for you. And I think when I talk about we're not even running the same race, it it, it really has to do with me feeling like as women, we have to stop competing with each other. And one of the things that I think about a lot is, um, I I was at a conference and Lisa Cogden, the illustrator was the keynote speaker and Mm -hmm. she's so lovely and so talented and brilliant and, um, friendly and all the wonderful things (laughs) that you can say about any woman who's in a creative business. 
And she gets asked the question a lot, how do you get so many things done? Because she does. She is an illustrator for published books. She does residencies. She has a shop where she sells products, you know, all these types of things. And one of the answers that she gives, or she gave at this conference, and I think she gives quite consistently, is that, well, I, I don't have children. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's, you know, that's fair, and I understand that. But also... When we say that collectively as women, aren't we almost downplaying our drive and success to a certain extent? Like she's able to get so many things done because she makes choices in her business, just like those of us who do have children make choices in our business. And she puts the pedal to the metal at certain times and takes it off the gas. And and in that way, you know, we all kind of are running the same race. And I think you know, moving forward, one of the things we have to work on as a group of women in business, especially in creative business, is to not really quantify our success or how much we get done, really. It's about how much we get done in the day based upon whether or not we have children. Because, you know, I know women that have five children that get more done in a day than I do Yeah, yeah. (laughs) with one. And it's like, it's really about the choices we make in how to spend our time, and also just our mindset, our stamina, how we self-care for ourselves, like all those things really factor into how how much we can get done in a day. And for some people, it's just more than others. And those of us that are at a slower pace, you know, need, need to kind of make peace with that at some point. Like to be sane, it means that I have to move at five miles an hour instead of 25 with or without kids, with or without a partner, with or without employees, you know, like whatever it is that we're kind of quantifying as part of our success or our ability to get things done to really just be like as a whole, you know, we're all running separate races. <laughs> we're all running separate races because just our, our makeup and our stamina and how we choose to spend our time is all different. Yeah, I wonder, I'm wondering if she wasn't speaking to her own limitations, though. I know a lot of people who just know that about themselves, that they would not be able to live the definition of success that they see for themselves if they had to also care for other beings. And I think that that's a really honest statement and maybe not just one that has to do with women. I know Chris Hardwick, the comedian, has said the same thing whenever they, you know, whenever anybody asks, how are you, you know, how are you doing stand up around the country and also, you know, producing these shows and being a host in these shows? And he said, well, I don't have a family. All I do is work. My time is only dedicated to work. And even though I absolutely agree that, you know, many of the mama can can multitask, you know, the crap out of a day versus, you know, <laughs> others. It, I mean, the truth is that if you have nobody else to care for, you do end up having more hours in the day. And if you have a great team who backs you up, then the time looks differently. But I and I agree with you. I think that maybe we all ru- are running at a different race or running a different race, but I wonder what it would be like if it was more of a relay, you know, if we could just sort of give that to each other and admire that of each other. Exactly. I think the key is, is having a relay race and, and to be successful in any endeavor, you really need to know yourself Yeah, and what your limitations are. And, and that comes up with, I think it's David Sedaris who tells a story in one of his books. I, I forget which one I've read them all like a million times, yeah. but he talks about a friend of his. who's a very successful businesswoman in Australia. I think it's one of the books where he talks about going to Australia and she tells him a story about having all four burners on the stove and how one burner is work. One is relationship one is family and one is friends I think and how you can't have them all full on full blast at the same time yeah and that if the work burner is on full blast then you have to turn one of the other ones off completely whether it's like for a day or six months or a year but you can't have all four going at the same time you have to have one full blast and then you know two two other ones like on a simmer (laughs) yeah yeah and one completely off and you know, one of the things that my mom said to me a long time ago was, you can have it all, but not all at once. Right. And I, I think that's that's certainly the choice that 
that I make with my business every day is knowing, okay, what's important to me right now in terms of parenthood is being there as much as I can. And as my daughter gets older, that might change. As she becomes more independent, that might change. But the real success for me at the end of the day is like, do I still have the freedom to make that decision? Was it another day where I took her to the bus, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, at, at a reasonable time and I picked her up from the bus when school was over and we got to spend time together. And as long as that keeps happening right now for me, when I close the door to my studio, I'm like, wow, that was, that was another really successful day. And it, it definitely has mean, it has meant saying no a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it means too, that I have to really shut down my interaction on social media sometimes. And, um, that's, you know, it's kind of like be the cat, <laughs> sail your own ship. Because I find that as much as I want to, especially Instagram, because Instagram can be so interactive with my customers and my followers, but there's some days where I just have to say, okay, you know what? Today I just have to post a photo yeah. and then kind of flee. And let it go. Yeah. And I think that's so important what you're saying because that this only you are going to know what needs to be cut out or what, you know, I know for myself, I've kind of had to come to peace with the opposite because I've really, my home is as a, as an encourager, you know, I really want to be out there rallying the troops to, to be creative. And so that requires way more time on social media and way less time making. And that was tough for me too, because of the love um, that I have for making. And so I think that's another really important thing that you're saying is that we have to make these decisions ourselves. And this is just another way of defining our own success. And we as women have to support the fluidity in that definition. Absolutely. And I think at different times, it's different things that are working or it's different things that are important to us. And for me right now, holding on to the production of my jewelry design is essential. I, for my own sanity, <laughs> and whether it hap- whether it you know happens to have to do with ha- you know having a child that's five and all the challenges with that, yeah. but for my sanity, I need to be making. My hands need to be busy, and so that's a choice that I've made. And that choice has meant slower growth for sure. Um, not chasing down partnerships where I know I cannot fulfill that need successfully and in a way that's important to me now. And knowing that, you know what, next year it might be different. Six months from now it might be different. But being flexible enough in how I define success and how I run my business to say, okay, you know what, I have a plan written in paper in a book that says when when I'm ready or when I can say yes to a partnership where there's thousands of units (laughs) that I'm producing, then here's what has to happen before that. Six months before, I feel like I'm ready to let go of a little bit or spend my time a little differently. Here are the things that have to happen. You know, I have to look for a hire. I have to look for production help, manufacturing, you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And just to have that there, to know that it's there and to know that when I do make that decision, it will be successful, a different kind of success than what I'm looking at right now, but one that will hopefully be part of that relay you're talking about that will be supported. Well, and I think that having the confidence to know that if you say no to someone, as long as you're kind and talented and intelligent and don't burn any bridges, it will not be the last offer you ever get. And that was a tough one for me. It took me years. It's really hard. I don't, and I don't know, you know, when I do creative business consulting, which is I love doing it. It's such a small part of my business. Don't you love it? I just came off a South by Southwest mentor and doing that. And I just, oh, I just loved it. It felt great. It totally lights my fire. And so I've kept it as part of my business. I mean, I, I work with only like three to maybe four if someone is really, really like, please, 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 please yeah. <laughs> work with me at, at, you know, at a time. And that's sometimes throughout the whole year, I might be working with one and then add two more, but I keep it like very small so that it's manageable because I love it so much. But, um, one of the things I, I talked about people just starting out is I'm often wondering, like, can you, is there some way to fake that confidence in saying no and knowing that your business will survive in the beginning? And yeah. I, I really don't think that it is. I think it's something that's so internal that you just have to get to a point of survival of being like, you know what, I've been around for four years, five years, 
for some people it's three years, for some people it's 10 years, whatever it is for them personally to be like, I can actually say no. And in, in a way that, you know, in, in my experience, when I say no, it's like, it, it almost makes people want it more. And they're like, okay, well, let me know when you're ready. And then when I do, it like 95% of the time it happens mm-hmm. because people are really respectful of the fact that you're like, you know what, for me to do this the way that works out the best for you and the best for me, it needs to have like 100% of my attention. Yeah, yeah. And it's not going to right now. It will, you know, I'm looking at my calendar, it will in six months or, or I'm seeing in eight months it can work. Or maybe it's just saying no for three weeks and then yeah. being like, we can do it. But that was definitely something that I just couldn't fake until I had just learned over time that when I did say no, I still woke up the next morning. I still had my business. Right, right. Nothing had failed miserably. I wasn't like, you know, shunned from society <laughs> because I had made the choice to be like, I. it's just the way I'm running things right now. It just can't happen. Or you know what? I do want it to happen, but it means I need to do X, Y, and Z. And it, that's going to take me three months to implement. What do you think about that? And the person either saying yes or no. And I found that most of the time, it's like totally yes. Well, yeah, <laughs> like, let's yeah. circle back. Because in business time, you know, sometimes three months when people are looking at their calendar is like the soonest anything can happen anyway. Sure. Sure. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, maybe it is a part confidence, but really it's, it's it sounds like it's part experience. I know for me, it took me, you know, I made a major decision, career decision, you know, just a few months ago. And for me, I had to remind myself, you have always gotten back up. Like you've, like, when have you not been able to hustle? And it's just that reminder. So I don't know if it's confidence, just reminding myself of my experience. And it sounds like um, you're having a similar experience yourself. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It it comes down to experience because it's it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to feel that way at the beginning. And we, you know, we try to say people like making wiser choices say, you know, it's okay to say no, but it's um But the rent has to be paid or the mortgage has to be paid or right. kids' school tuition has to be paid. All of that really glamorous life stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um all you know, it all has to be figured out and I don't it's it's almost like the experience of just surviving it. It's like when something happens with when your kid falls down, the first time your kid falls down and starts crying and then they get back up and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I totally survived falling off my bike." Yeah. Not not an you know, not a nightmare. Maybe the next time I take that jump, like I hit it a little differently or something, but I totally survived it and um it's like it's just like with the riding the bike thing, you know. I don't I don't know how you really teach that other than just you keep getting back up and learning that you've gotten back up X amount of times now. So you know, the next time you make a decision that feels risky or this and that, it's like you know what I've been here this whole time. I'm still here, <laughs> even on the years where I made less money or more money or whatever the choices that we make that have led to how the numbers crunch at the end of the year. It's like I'm still here, still surviving. Yeah, still doing my thing. You mentioned um, you mentioned that you've written down what your goals are, what your plan looks like in the future. Are you a big journaler? I've noticed that you also um, you also don't sketch. You prefer to write down in words um, and then start with the prototype, which is totally what I do too. But are you in general? Are you a are you a writer? Are you a journaler? I used to be a journaler when I was uh, a teenager and then in my early 20s when I was, you know, doing all those fantastic things you do in your early 20s, hopefully, if you're doing it right, you know, yeah, <laughs> following musicians on tour and traveling and running around and doing all that great stuff. I journaled a lot. Um, and then as I got busier doing lots of other things, the time to myself became more important that it was physical, that I was actually doing something with my body in terms of, you know, self care and putting time aside for myself. And for me, that's, that's yoga. And I started a, I started a yoga teacher training a couple months ago. And part of that has been journaling, which has been very interesting because I haven't done it in so long. And so it has me going through the poses that I do each day as part of my practice and kind of writing about it. And when I started doing it, I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't done this in so long. Like, uh, 
I, I couldn't even really write about my own reflection of knowing like, okay, I feel energetic today, so I'm going to do these poses or I'm feeling tired, so I'm going to do this and that. Hmm. So that's been interesting. I don't know if I will, I, I don't, I don't think I'll go back to journaling. I mean, right now for whatever reason, and, and I think that's partly why I like to hold on to production of my work too, is that everything there, the physical component feels important to me now, the movement, the, the making and with prototypes, it's so interesting you say that because you're the first person that I've spoken to that doesn't do the big sketch thing with the whole exact it's like for me as as an artist there's so much frustration and competition in the idea in my mind and what is actually possible yeah when you're fabricating something physically and I feel like I want to allow this space and conversation between the physical materials and the idea instead of having this very exact image that I've put onto paper of this is how, you know, okay, this is how X necklace for my spring, you know, my upcoming spring collection is supposed to look where it's like, I have an idea, I put it in words. And then as I'm working with the materials, when I find that, okay, this, it's just, it's not, it's going against physics. Like it's not possible. Right. I can actually listen to the materials and have more flexibility in the design which ultimately makes me happier and I think makes for better design. I think it does too. And, but there's, so in, you know, the, my sort of main focus is knit and crochet wear design, um, at least in the design respect. And there's such a clash um, amongst people in the industry about whether or not when you're designing and pattern writing, whether or not you should write the entire pattern out first and then work on it. And that is just not something I'm great at. And I really need to see it forming, um, you know, as I'm designing, but I get it. It doesn't, I mean, it takes more time. I definitely can't send everything off to production stitchers, but um, it's really nice to hear that somebody, that somebody else that works <laughs> with needle arts also just needs to have the materials in their hands to sort of know what it's going to be. I, I think especially with anything fiber-based, because while it's very flexible, there's also limitations, especially when I'm doing needlework on like Ada fabric or something that's for cross stitch. It's a grid. Mm -hmm. And so whatever amazing <laughs> idea I have for a pattern, there's all these variables. There's, there's limitations, yeah. Yeah, the, there's the color of the fabric, which is one variable. There's the color of the thread, which is another. There's the pattern that I'm creating. Those are all the variables that I get to play with. But in terms of creating the actual pattern, it's a grid. Yeah. So I can have an idea, but it still has to work first, you know, on the grid. And for me, I'd much rather, you know, say, oh, this is this is the, the inspiration is X, Y, and Z, or, you know, the branches of a tree, this and that coming out this way with these types of possible geometric designs, and then sit down and, and just do it. Because otherwise, I feel I'm, I'm so blocked into something that might not be possible and then you know as creative people we're always wanting to solve the puzzle so then yeah. three days go by and I'm still trying to solve this puzzle that is just not going to work and it's almost like kind of letting that go and having a conversation with the materials of like okay what what are your limitations what do you want to do based upon this idea I had really you know in the end I think allowing ourselves that flexibility is letting the materials that we're choosing to shine through. And it's like, why else would we be using <laughs> the materials? It's like trying to make a drawing look like a painting. Well, then just paint. Where do you think that, do you think that that's part of your art school background? Where do you think that, that um, permission slip for um, fluidity comes from? I, I, I was reading an interview that you did um, on Inspired by Beatrice Clay um, where you said life is full of surprises, but when you're creative, there's an ability and a faith that you can change your mind, switch gears, and build something new. What does that look like for you? Where did you Where did you get that permission from? Where did Where did that philosophy come from? I think it was was partly due to growing up in a creative household. My mom is an artist. Um, she was an arts educator as I was growing up, but she started out her career as a visual merchandiser. She did windows for Bloomingdale's in Manhattan for a oh, long wow. time. 
And so we just had stuff around. Um, because in those days, everything went to the dumpster. There was no recycling, you know. <laughs> it, yeah, was, yeah. it was the 60s and 70s. So you put something in a window and you were done with it. They probably burned it in a, you know, burned it or it went in a dumpster. And, you know, a lot of the artists in those days would take it home. So we had bolts of fabric and trimmings and anything you can imagine that would go into a win- window display. Just, you know, in our basement or in a, a room that where my mom had her supplies. So there were always things around to experiment with. And from the time, you know, before I was my daughter's age, I was taking these big bolts of fabric and draping Barbie dolls. Wow. Not even knowing that that's what draping, yeah. <laughs> that that's what draping was, but it's just like stuff we had around. And my mom was always like, this is here for you to use and do whatever you want with it. And there was no right and wrong with art supplies. So I was experimenting from a very early age and being encouraged to experiment and that that was always, you know, okay in our house. And it wasn't, it, and that was extended to, you know, watching my dad do woodworking and he was, he learned how to woodwork from my grandfather who was a, was a carpenter. And that's not what my dad did for a living, but he was always fixing things around the house. And my mom's brother was an artist and my mom's mom was always doing things creative. So it, it was sort of like everywhere I went was this message of like, people are just making and doing, and it yeah. doesn't matter if it's what they do for a living or not. They're just, here are all the ways of making and doing. So I was constantly seeing people succeed and fail <laughs> at creative endeavors and just making decisions along the way. Like, okay, you know, even with my dad, like watching him patch a hole in drywall, like, ooh, all right, we got to sand it down and go back in and do it again. Mm Because it's just like, for whatever reason, the weather, or you know, there's so many sort of different things that can affect any, any endeavor that involves your hands. But so that was one just kind of being around it. And then the second was, was just art school. I mean, I can't say enough about (laughs) the heartache and the splendor and the kick in the shins that getting... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, a BFA or an MFA really does to you. Um, I was, I went a little bit later. I started at a liberal arts college in Pennsylvania called Lafayette College, which is a great school. My husband went there. Um, we sort of knew each other there and then met again later. But um, I had a mentor there. I had a couple of mentors there. One was um, Curly Holton, who's a well-known printmaker and another was Ross Gay, who was a student there, but is now a, a well-known poet. And Curly had said to me at one point, you know, if you really want to do this seriously, you have to leave. Yeah. And and that to someone who, you know, <laughs> 20 or 19 yeah. was like the scariest thing I'd ever heard. You mean I have to go somewhere else and make new friends and have a different experience if I want to do art for a living? And he was like... Yeah. He's like, honestly, there's only so much I can give you here and I can give you as much as I can. You know, you can be my assistant. You can help me run yeah. prints of, of books and prints that are going to museums and all the stuff. But he's like, I can't give you the experience of art school. And he's like, I really think that that's everything. And that will let you know immediately <laughs> whether this is a life you're interested in or not. And so... I had, you know, I had stayed a little bit longer and then went, I'd gone abroad and then decided, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to try this art school thing because I'd like to know now, you know, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to yeah. spend my life wondering like, what if I did, what if I didn't? And my parents were very supportive. My mom had been to art school, so it wasn't like, I wasn't fighting a tide in my family. It was very normal, you know, and I had, I had started training earlier when I was in high school. I went to an after school program where I was trained, you know, training quite seriously. But, um, just the experience of like putting your truth out there (laughs) and Mm -hmm. having people either trample or celebrate it over and over and over again (laughs) is I, I think you, you learn the rules that you need to have in order to move through it gracefully how to take things in, how to shut things out. And also just by exploring different mediums. And that was really one of the things that I feel like I was blessed with at the time at the San Francisco Art Institute. They had 
created an interdisciplinary model where you could essentially write your own curriculum. Oh, so, wow. yeah. So I went in and I took, I said, okay, this is, you know, the cohesive body of work, the big buzzwords that all the <laughs> art schools, mm -hmm. you know, do. And they said, okay, well, your cohesive body of work is X, Y, and Z. What do you want to support that? And I said, okay, well, photography, printmaking, uh, metal sculpture, all of these things, you know, drawing, figure drawing, all of this. And they said, okay, you know, we will, these are the classes that we're saying you have to take in order to make that happen. And so I left having a very solid grasp on many different mediums and knowing that the best way to take a photograph is to take a photograph mm -hmm. and to yeah. really use the camera and not try to turn it into a painting. You know, the best way to paint is to have a conversation with the paints and not wish it was you were going to have the control that you have in a, in a different medium. Because there are different mediums where you can have, you know, like 98% control. And then there's mediums where you can learn through practice and skill building and maybe talent to have a certain amount of control, but it's never going to be the same. So to really trust yourself in that choice and allow within the boundaries of the material that you're choosing to work with, then be able to say, okay, I'm going to let go and allow the surprises to happen because I'm working within a realm that I've dedicated this moment to instead of being like, gosh, you know, I'm trying to get a water effect with a graphite pencil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out of all of those um, mediums that you just listed, none of them <laughs> include um, fiber. And you are now, I mean, you're a needleworks artist. Can you explain to me how that transference occurred? Yeah. I, I had been watching both my grandmothers. My, my business, Zelma Rose, is named after my grandmothers. Um, Zelma, who died you know, a handful of years ago, and Rose Marie, who's about to be 93, mm -hmm. I think, the end of the month. She's still alive and still crochets for an hour every day. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And has her hour, you know, and then has her hour of piano and all these different things. She actually said something really interesting to my mom last year. She said that as she's aged and as her memory has started to go and there's days where she finds it, you know, her hands hurt and she can't play piano or she can only crochet for 15 minutes, whatever it is, she felt like the best gift she had given herself in life was to be creative. Wow. Because uh, just allowing herself time to explore her creativity in many different ways. Because if she can't play piano, she can sing. Mm -hmm. If she's having a day when she can't sing, she can crochet. If she's having a day when she can't crochet, she can draw. If she's having a day when she can't draw, she can record a poem with a recorder. You know, she, it was like an endless choice that she was able to circle through in order to feel like she was living. What a wonderful role model. Amazing. I mean, I, I'm so, I was so lucky to be surrounded by these incredible women that weren't afraid of their creativity. And while Rose went, you know, Rose taught me to, to knit by banging on the table with a knitting needle like a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and Rosemary was going, keep going, keep going, keep going, knit pearl, knit pearl, you know. Cute. And that was one experience. And then Zelma who really was a um, was really into needlepoint. She showed me her side of the family. We had, you know, those incredible linens that are free form cross stitch. Yeah. Like a table setting for like eight people. And you're like, there was no electricity. When did my great, great, great grandmother even have time <laughs> to do this? But um, that's the way life was. And people took immense pride in, in working on these things. And Zelma would always have a needlepoint easel up and be working on something when we would be there. And I, she would invite me into her room or the sun patio, and I would watch her, and I would hand her the color threads, and it was completely quiet. Hmm. And she wouldn't say anything. Maybe we were listening to music. You know, maybe it was the afternoon, and she was having her scotch, whatever, you know, whatever it was. Hey, that's crucial. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfectly quiet. And hmm. she would say, okay, hand me, you know, if she had the colors coded or 
what, you know, if it was the only red on the table, whatever, hand me this, hand me that. And I would just watch her. And so needlework as a crafting element was always very alive. And I was playing with embroidery and things like that from the time I was pretty young. And then when I was in art school at SFAI, my body of work was essentially fiber. I was a fiber artist in the late 90s when that wasn't necessarily a thing that people could recognize. Now when you say fiber artist, the general population goes, okay, that means, you know, knit, crochet, or quilting, or something, weaving, something within a realm that's fiber-based. But in those days, like, it wasn't really... You were a quilter or you were a knitter. You were this or you were that. And the body of work that I was doing for my, you know, the culmination of my degree was, they were calling it mixed media, but Mm -hmm. my, you know, my final show was a quilt. It was cross-stitch on cheesecloth. It was um, drawing and sewing things onto tea bags. It was a multitude of different things. It, you know, I had made dolls that had clothes and were, fi- you know, fiber-based. So it was a multitude of things that today would no doubt be categorized as, <laughs> as fiber arts and definitely involved needlework. But it was sort of the, it was still kind of considered this mixed media thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I feel like I've been doing it for a very long time and and probably initially it's something that was an undercurrent for me as really craft and then it turned into a design element as a jewelry designer and very recently it's turned into a a very fine arts type of a feeling for me Um, I have my first fine art show that I've had in like 15 years in May (laughs) that's exciting it's very exciting. It's exciting and completely nerve wracking because um, I've been working on some pieces and my studio is at home, which is as a mom and being the type of parent, I want to be the only way <laughs> it's going to work. I hear you, sister. <laughs> yeah. Virtual high five on that yeah. one. Um, speaking of, are you speaking with your hands right now? I can't see you. Totally. Okay, yeah. I can hear the jingly jangly <laughs> of your bracelet. <laughs> so I could tell you were speaking with your hands. Let me ask you this. Um, for you, this is something that I, I've, I'm always surprised, but there's a definite like sort of like sharks versus jets, you know, rivalry between the word craft and the word art. Um, and you've used both of those within the past few sentences. For you, what, if any, difference is there? It's the physical feeling. Hmm. And I didn't know that it was really hard to put my finger on. So a a good example would be a year ago, I had started working in in a fine arts direction with my cross stitch. And the cross stitch that I do normally is for teaching purposes and also as design elements for my jewelry which I do see as being artistic, but it's also a product. So that means it has specific rules in terms of durability, in terms of, um, you know, style, trend. There are things to consider that I don't consider when I'm creating what I would say would be a fine art piece. And that's just good biz- you know, that's just good business sense, right? To think right. about trend and colorways and length and durability and all these kinds of things when you're making a product, no matter what you're making. So that part of my brain is very alive in the design process for the Zelma Rose product, the necklaces, the pieces and all that. And also when I'm teaching, so that I can show people design and it's accessible for a beginner class or an intermediate class, whatever those decisions are. And about a year ago, I started playing around with cross stitch as a, as a, in my mind as a fine arts element. Like what, what is possible within this boundary? What, how can I talk to the materials to stretch this idea further for me? And I started working on these pieces and was doing all different kinds of things, crazy things like cross stitching backwards and upside down and on both different sides of the canvas and in monochrome and really trying to create as much texture as I could. 
and started to use aerial landscapes as inspiration. So I would go to like Google Maps and <laughs> mm-hmm. look at an aerial landscape of like Golden Gate Park and see a, a very light or a very dark area of a treescape or something like that and start using that for the basis of the overall shape I was going to cross stitch and then within that create a lot of texture in monochrome and then have them be on a hoop and that was the finished piece. And I was doing it very happily, um, very, very time consuming. The minutia of it, of cross stitch, as you know, if you're just doing the tiny, small, basic cross stitch is like, <laughs> you know, to cover an area of space that's 10 inches by 10 inches could be 20 hours. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's just exhaustingly long, but the process was, you know, I was like, okay, this is a statement I want to make. So the process is the process, but I still had this feeling like, the physical movement of it, there was something in the conversation with the materials and the way I felt just as physically being able to move in it was not like the climax of where I wanted to take it. Like there was still another step it had to go. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know where it was going to come from. So I just kept doing it, you know, and had faith that like, okay, by the time I've done this like 50 times, maybe, you know, or I have X number of these pieces, maybe I'll just feel like in my heart and in my hands that it's reached that place. And for me, there's something very physical about painting. And when I was painting normally, they were always very large. So there was a lot of body movement, you know, standing on my tippy toes or getting down really low and using the brush and is it going to be a dry brush or wet brush or whatever, but always very physical. And I felt like that was missing from these little teeny tiny marks and this very small thing that I was doing. So I was thinking on it and I had been talking to the person that's curating my show in May because I had originally brought them these pieces in the hoops and we had talked about what the show would look like with these and so one day I'm, I'm doing yoga <laughs> and I'm in a pose and all of a sudden I go, oh my gosh, I have to make them three-dimensional. Mm. I have to use the cord that I've been using for my jewelry pieces. I have, to, I have to try the cord. So I finished doing yoga and I ran into my studio and shut the door, <laughs> set the timer as to when I had to leave to go get my daughter and just started working with the cord, with knitting needles, with crochet hooks, with nautical knots, with all these different things. And before I knew it, I was standing, I was moving, my body was involved. I had all these other ideas. I'd taken out embroidery thread. I was doing French knots on the knots that I was tying in the cord. I was looking at aerial photographs. I was doing all this stuff. And I had something that, instead of lying flat on a canvas, was actually its own kind of sculpture, and I, I knew instantly, like I had that feeling in my body and I was like, this is it. This is where this has been meaning to go. It took a year and a half mm. <laughs> and it took a lot of work to get there, but this is where it is. And so I, you know, I played with it for about two weeks and then I sent an email to the curator being like, oh gosh, <laughs> we had decided what my show was going to look like already. And here I am being like, guess what? You know, the work has has um the work has changed so I can't imagine you're the first artist that has ever like been creatively inspired to change their show they've got to be used to that by now don't you think no luckily (laughs) the the shows at this wonderful store rare device that my friend Giselle owns and Alice is the the curator and she was like this is nothing new she's like I'm really glad you didn't say this the week of the show because that's when it usually happens (laughs) well it sounds like what you're saying is art Art is art when you feel like it's art. I think I think so. For, and for me, it's a physical feeling. For other people, it's how much their heart is involved. Um, for other people, it's, it's what they do. I think it's really, it's also how we define ourselves. Do we define ourselves as a crafter or an artist? It's like, well, how does it feel? You know, my first question to someone would be like, how does it feel when you're doing it? You know, if it's your mind and your hand and your heart, well, then guess what? (laughs) You know, it, it, it can be craft and it can also be art. You can be a crafter and you can be an artist. And 
I think a lot of times for people that line has to do with whether or not they're making a product. And I feel like that's unfair because if we're gauging by time and creativity or how much passion we have for something, you know, I know a lot of people that are in the creative product business and they are pedal to the metal, passion, dedication, creativity, the the likes of just blows my mind every single time. And so I think we have to really stretch what we think of as, as art just at, in general. And then also for ourselves, be open to defining it differently. And maybe it's one part of our business feels more like craft. Another part feels more like art and that's okay. So be bold. Yeah. Well, Lisa, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. I appreciate it. Oh, I so appreciate it, Vicki. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Lisa Anderson Schaefer's jewelry line, fine art show information, and classes can be found on her website. For more information and links, please just go to this episode's show notes page at vickihowell.com slash craftish. Craftish is produced in Austin, Texas by me and mixed and edited by Dave Campbell. If you like this episode, well, just, uh, you know, tell someone. And then maybe also, if you have a second, you could click on over to iTunes and write a review or just give it a rating. You taking the time to do that means a lot to me. And also, it helps listeners find this podcast. And if more people are listening to Craftish, then they will also be hopefully talking about creativity, which is, frankly, a win-win for the community. If you're interested in learning more about my other projects, including my books, kits, and online courses, go to vickihowell.com. You can also find info there if you're interested in sponsoring this podcast. Also, please follow me on social media. It's at Vicki Howell, except for that pesky Pinterest. I didn't, I missed it on that one. So there I am at, I am Vicki Howell. I'm shaking my fist right now. Um, if you're a knitter or crocheter in Southern California area, please check out Vogue Knitting Live in Pasadena on May 13th through 15th. I will be there introducing a screening of the documentary, Yarn the Movie, and teaching a make and take and emceeing a fashion show and doing a book signing. All of that is taking place on the marketplace floor, and I would love to see you there. I've included a link to that also on the show notes page. Tune into the next episode of Craftish with my guest, Portland based textile artist Anna Joyce. That'll go live next Tuesday. Until then, though, take time to share, talk about, and spend time with your craft, whatever it may be. Breathe in, craft out. Bye. <laughs>